Uh, I'm Joanne Larkey, uh, Chair of the Winters History Project, and on behalf of this committee and the four co-sponsoring organizations for this event, I wanted to thank you all for coming. It's a wonderful crowd. I hope we have chairs for everyone. There are more in the back, I believe, if you need them. Um, and to, uh, by way of getting acquainted, I wanted to ask how many of you in the audience live South of Buda Creek in Solano County. Raise your hands. And how many live north of Buda Creek in Yola County? <laughs> and do we have anyone from uh, west of the Devil's Gate in Napa County? Perhaps not. But I think uh, that um, we are also honoring the people that farm along Puta Creek. So those of you that are doing that presently, would you please raise your hands? <laughs> yes, well, thank you. The Winter's History Project was organized in 2009 under the auspices of the City of Winters. The project's stated goals and missions are to provide a historical contents and a profound sense place for all residents and visitors. Through a celebration of the historic legacy of the city of Winters. Uh, an initial exhibit um, was uh, initiated in uh, 2009 uh, with uh, photo spring photographs and artifacts that related to the legacy of the area's horticultural industry. That began in 1842 when John Wolfskill introduced the first production of fruits and vines in the Sacramento Valley. During the last four years, a history project has also sponsored two day-long agricultural symposiums that were held in conjunction with uh, UCD faculty um, and the uh, agricultural. The <coughs> excuse me. The um, losing my place here. Um, uh, those, the faculty uh, at the university that are affiliated with the Wolfskill Experiment Station that's located out on Puda Creek Road, uh, that was the uh, home of John Wolfskill that was donated to the university in 1933. We've also collaborated with local businesses and organizations uh, to uh, promote a number of exhibits and uh, historical events. Meanwhile, the archival collection that we've been seeking uh, and the artifacts as well have been accumulated. Uh, they're growing and uh, we also welcome more. So any of you that have historic photographs of the creek or of this region, uh, we would be very happy to have the opportunity to make copies of those so that you can retain the originals and we can have a record of this uh, area. Basically, the Winter's History Project is an expanding interactive model for a museum without walls, since we have no walls at this point. But we have the long-term goal of a permanent location for a museum. So with uh, the donations that many of you have given us tonight, we can uh, not only gratefully receive them, but also hopefully attain our goal. It's a long-term project, but uh, we've had a tremendous amount of public support. Before we enjoy hearing from Professor Vogt tonight, um, who has traveled all the way from Texas to share a narrative about the book that he's published in, in 2007, I wanted to introduce the leaders of our uh, co-sponsoring uh, nonprofit organizations. Would they please stand as I call their names? First, Kathy Harriman. She is president of the Yellow County <laughs> Historical Society. 
Um, and um, that organization uh, has taken the Winter History Project under its wing so that we can maintain our tax deductible status, and we're very grateful for that. They did the same thing for the Hattie Weber Museum in Davis, and uh, we're all working together to pr preserve the history of this area. I wanted to acknowledge uh, Lynn Meyer and Carol uh, Sienna. They're co-presidents of the Winter's the Friends of the Winters Library. <laughs> that organization not only encourages people to read books, like the one we're hearing about tonight, but also they have uh, promoted a lot of pro programs and helped the funding of our local Winters Library. Um, I wanted to introduce Ted Smith. Ted is the long-term president of the Yellow County Archives, the Friends of the Yellow County Archives. And that group not only uh, supports the Yellow County Archives financially, but they also uh, provide a lot of volunteer staff that keeps the archives going in these difficult financial times. So we appreciate his participation. If you've not already seen the display of photographs that's up on the stage, um, I <clears throat> encourage, we'll be showing those again after the program concludes. Um, so please take the time to uh, also uh, look at the displays that are over here on the west wall. Um, uh, the other person I wanted to uh, introduce is Mar Marshall. Martha Rocha, uh, who is now the Educational Coordinator for the Peterson County. Um, people from this whole area are very well of the wonderful work that Pitt Creek Council is doing. And uh, Martha is the stand-in tonight for Libby Earthman, who's the director of Pitt Creek Council. She unfortunately is away in Colorado uh, getting training so that she can uh, continue to um, support the important role of protecting and restoring the natural waterway that is Kuda Creek. Um, Professor Bockwood will do a book signing after the uh, program has concluded over here on one of these tables. Um, and uh, I think people from the Avid Reader are here with extra books if anyone cares to buy them. We're also deeply indebted to Mike Sebastian of the Winters Visitor Center and director of the Winters Chamber of Commerce for his help in promoting this event. Um, please find the time to visit the Visitor Center. It's just down below us on the first level. I'm not sure it's open late tonight, but uh, whenever you're visiting here, there are pictorial displays uh, from the Winters History Project as well as he is so good about providing any information you would want to know about this whole region. Our thanks are also due to Dave Fleming. He's in the back there at the console. He's the proprietor of the Palms Playhouse, which has brought music back to the Winter's Opera House. Um, for the last many years, and everyone really enjoys being here. Um, it's uh, incidentally, in case you're uh, interested, um, this building itself was built in 1875 by one of the successful fruit growers who lived along Pitt Creek Council. Not only did well with fruit, but he invested in the town as well. Um, the uh, curtain that you see over on the east wall is the original um, drop curtain that was for the stage showing the local businessmen who helped support, support a renovation of this building in 1890. So those are uh, maybe of interest. The PowerPoint presentation that some of you have already seen and will be showing again after the program was uh, assembled by members of the uh, Historic uh, History Project, um, Tom Crisp, Woody Friday, and myself. Um, and we would encourage you to look at that and see if you have pictures that you might in add to this file. 
Uh, Mark Wilson is our videographer who is volunteering his time to tape record this program so that we have an archival copy of this event. Uh, and now I would like to uh, call Craig McNamara up here. He is going to introduce our speaker for the evening. Craig is not, and his family are not only Pewter Creek farmers, but they also, um, he has created the land-based learning center uh, out on his ranch, uh, and their um, youth from inner city can come and have an experience, a hands-on experience of working in agriculture. Uh, volunteers have supported that facility and are helping with the restoration work that's being done along the creek. In his spare time, Craig also serves uh, on the Santa Monica County um, Land Trust. He chairs the California State Agricultural, <coughs> excuse me, I should have taken a cough drop. Um, he's also uh, uh, is on the State Board of Agriculture and is on the board of the American Farmland Trust. He claims he is the, holds the record for purchasing the most numbers of Dr. Block's book. Uh, he, I'll let him tell that story, but uh, we thank him for his participation. Uh, thank you so much. We can't thank Joanne Larkey and the Winners uh, History Project for all that you do to enrich our community and bring such wonderful, exciting events to winners. It's really such a pleasure to uh, introduce you, Dr. Uh, Voigt. Um, in his book, After the Gold Rush, which I have to say is one of my favorite books, I am the Johnny Appleseed of, uh, of this book. If you had, before tonight, if you didn't read it, I would order it from Amazon and bring it to your door. I won't be doing that tonight. But um, he writes about one of the most um, unique natural resources and glorious watersheds, Puta Creek. If you Google Puta, if you just put that into your computer, you will find that our unique watershed is the first thing that pops up. I thought you'd enjoy um, what Wikipedia has to say about Puta Creek. So here it goes. The creek originates from springs on the east side of Cobb Mountain, south of the town of Cobb in southwestern Lake County. It descends eastward to the town of Whispering Pines, where it turns southeast, paralleling State Route 175. It passes down the town of Anderson Springs, where it joins Bear Creek Canyon. North of Middletown, it curves counterclockwise around Harbin Mountain, merging in close succession with Dry Creek, Helena Creek, Crazy Creek, Harbin Creek, and Big Canyon Creek. From Harbin Mountain, it flows east again, joining Buck Snort Creek, then enters Napa County. At a, at, at a confluence with Hunting Creek, about 11 miles, 18 kilometers, east of Middletown. In Napa County, the creek flows southeast, merging with Bucks Creek just before it empties into Lake Berryessa. The story's not over. Downstream of Monticello Dam, on the southeastern corner of the lake, Pewter Creek leaves Napa County and becomes the boundary between Yolo County and Salam County. In this section, it offers excellent fly fishing. Opportunities are year-round. The stream continues east along State Route 128, meeting Pleasance Creek, McEwen Creek, and Dry Creek, and passing through the town of Winters to reach Interstate 505. From there, it continues eastward, paralleling Pewter Creek, Road to Stevenson Bridge Road. A few miles east of Davis, the county line turns south, but the creek continues eastward, passing south of Davis to feed into Yolo Bypass, about a quarter mile, 400 meters, west of the Sacramento Deepwater Canal. Well, that's Wikipedia for you, and I think, you know, I would encourage you to Google Cuba, and that's, that's what you'll find. So David is no stranger to Pewter Creek and to our region. He was born in Seattle, and his parents brought him to uh, be raised in El Cerrito. After completing his uh, uh, graduate work at UC Day and writing his first book, Cultivating California, he stumbled upon one of the most fascinating maps of his life. It was titled The Big Ranch, and it depicted one of the largest ranches in Northern California, located right here in Yolo and Slano County. And that began his research for this book. 
So, in the prologue of David's book, I just want to read you one, one paragraph, because I was taken by it. This is on page 8. The gold rush played out its economic, social, and cultural implications in a number of rural communities in Northern California that proliferated in the 1850s and 1860s. Pewter Creek, 20 miles west of John Sutter's New Helvetia in the lower Sacramento Valley, was one such community. It serves as this book's center stage. The miners turned farmers who made it one of the richest agricultural districts in the state are the key historical actors. This dramatic story, in its broadest sense, is an extended commentary on an American, on American optimism and hard work, a true-to-life allegory of the American dream amid the harsh realities of life in rural California after the gold rush. For the main characters, George Washington Pierce, Champion I. Hutchison, Jerome C. Davis, and William Montgomery capture the opening spotlight. I've often wondered, what makes winters so unique? And I've come up, uh, I've come to the conclusion it's the people. It's our ancestors who struggled through drought, fire, and floods, and I learned in the book that in the 20 years between 1862 and 1888, I counted eight major floods, um, four significant droughts, and one great fire. You'll probably correct me on that, David. But you know, it's, it's our ancestors who struggled through this, but it's you today, it's the people today who really make this community what it is. And in David's way, uh, uh, language, you'll read in the book, it makes this area glorious. David currently lives with his wife in College uh, Station, Texas, where he serves as professor and head of the Texas A&M History Department. Please join me in remark in welcoming one of those great resources to our community, David Voigt. Thank you, Craig, for that very nice introduction. It's been a pleasure getting to know you today. Thank you too, Joanne. Uh, for putting all this uh, uh, together as the point person uh, for the various uh, volunteer groups. It's just an absolute pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, thank you, Joanne, as well, uh, for your own wonderful work uh, on, on Poudre Creek. I took my copy of, my warlorn copy of Davis 68 out uh, the other day, uh, full of sentences underlined and comments up the margins and pages falling out of the book. Uh, tells you how much I use it. It's certainly the most cited source that I use uh, in the book. I want to thank just a few more people uh, who were sort of instrumental uh, in, in the uh, research of this book now, what, 10, 10, 12, 13 years ago. Uh, I'm not sure if he's here, but I want to quickly thank John Skarstad, uh, who's the uh, uh, director at the <coughs> Uh, special collections at UCD campus who introduced me to the George W. Pierce family papers some 20, 25 years ago. Uh, thanks too to uh, Mel Russell, uh, who's not here, who's out of the country, I believe, uh, who was the uh, former uh, archivist at the Yolo County Archives. Uh, Mel went so far beyond uh, what was necessary for me, I, I could just barely barely explain it. Uh, thanks also to Shifley Walters, uh, who I've just uh, loved to see uh, tonight uh, for her own work and for her sheer uh, enthusiasm uh, for my work uh, way back when. Thank you very, very much, Shifley. And, and last, lastly, uh, I want to thank uh, Virginia Isaacs, who's one of many dedicated volunteers uh, at the Yellow County Archives. Uh, Virginia served basically as my personal assistant uh, at the Yellow County Archives for many, many, many uh, days. Uh, Virginia passed away uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, I know she would very much have liked to be here tonight. So just to sort of orient you into what I'm doing, uh, I expect to go maybe 50 minutes or so uh, tonight after 16 years of teaching, everything I do takes 50 minutes. <laughs> 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 
So, we've been staring at Rattler, the trotting stallion, now for, for some time. Uh, Rattler died uh, on the ranch of Jerome C. Davis uh, on Poudre Creek in the lower Sacramento Valley on April 10th, 1863. Rattler was no ordinary horse. Owned by Davis and his two neighbors, Fred Werner and William Montgomery, Rattler won more races, took more premiums, and earned more in stud fees than any horse in Northern California over the course of his illustrious career. His record time of five minutes and 12 seconds in a two mile heat against Honest John at the State Fair three years earlier was already the stuff of legends. So much so that the Sacramento Daily Union ran Rattler's obituary as its featured news story on April 13th. The death of this fine animal, the paper bemoaned, will be regretted by turf men throughout the state. Rattler's passing was especially regretted by those who cheered him the most, settlers along Poudre Creek. The beloved trotting stallion helped put this burgeoning community on the map. Indeed, the celebration of Rattler's life and the mourning of his death reveal how quickly rural life matured in the decade or so after the gold rush, and more precisely, the resolve with which these miners turned farmers tried to replicate the Midwest back home for the overwhelming majority of them. If San Francisco was an instant city, as it's often portrayed, then Poudre Creek was an instant community. What took a generation or more in communities throughout the Midwest happened all at once in Poudre Creek. That is, a self-conscious community with many distinctive features evolved well beyond the frontier state. Poudre Creek was characterized not by subsistence farming, Indian wars, or kinship bonds, but by market-oriented agriculture, fierce legal battles, and displaced 49ers. Nonetheless, in just a few years, residents shared strong community sentiments, a specific sense of place, similar patterns of everyday life, common obligations, and a number of public rituals and institutions that pulled men and eventually women together as a social unit. Dreams of striking it rich preceded rural settlement in Poudre Creek, but did not preempt community. The legend of Rattler the Trouting Stallion could not have happened otherwise. Now let me just to orient you uh, just as I'm getting started. When I say put a creek, I guess you can turn the next slide. When I say put a creek, I mean three things. I mean A, the creek itself, and we've already heard ad nauseum from Wikipedia. <laughs> I also mean Puda Township which is how it's portrayed here in 1879. It looked like there are no, no landowners or, or uh, 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 square miles marked off uh, in the 1850s. Poudre Township is a political uh, entity, right? The 1851 uh, legislat legislature um, created uh, uh, out of the county, various counties in the state, divided them into townships for purposes of government, which I'll have more to say about, uh, about later. And thirdly, and sort of most importantly uh, for tonight, uh, by Poudre Creek, I mean a uh, community, right? A community that uh, geographers often call an open settlement community, although they don't use this term for California, I'm not quite sure why but open settlement community, meaning that there's no, there's no boundaries to it, there's no center, there's no downtown uh, Poudre Creek, if you will. It's a community because the people who live there believed it to be a community. If they went to, say, Sacramento and somebody asked them, 
uh, where, where are you from, they would have said Poudre Creek. The boundaries are more or less what you see. There, there aren't boundaries, but it's more or less what you might see there on the township. And I, I think I'm getting my, my, my facts straight here. What we're seeing is on the left, or on the, on the far right, which is the east, the eastern boundary, that's basically, that's, that's Mace Boulevard. Right? And if you go all the way across from, from east to west, where you see the, the shades differently, that's, uh, that's about where Stevenson's Bridge is. Right? Pretty far. And then from, from the creek itself up, you can just sort of count the square miles there. That's two miles above Cavell, what we know as today as Cavell. That was Puda Township. And for the most part, that was Puda Community, uh, which is my subject for tonight. Now, Puda Creek, for those who settled there uh, in the early 1850s, looked just like the Midwest, only better. The creek itself ran west to east out of the coast mountains across its alluvial fan, 25 miles into the vast Thule swamps that prevented it from emptying into the Sacramento River. Three miles to the north lay Laguna Cale, renamed Willow Slough by Anglo settlers, a long, narrow, and deep lake fed by the creek's annual overflows. Both suggested an abundance of water in this otherwise dry grassland region, and both created dense riparian forests, upwards of two miles wide, that provided fencing materials, wild game for hunting, and the promise of fertile soil. Indians, who had inhabited the area for more than a thousand years and had given the creek its name, posed no threat as numerous diseases uh, introduced by European traders had all but annihilated them 20 years earlier. There was a large local market of hungry miners and urban residents already accustomed to paying high prices for food. More than enough merchants 15 miles away in Sacramento to market the crop and still more down the easily navigated Sacramento River in San Francisco. Grain production and livestock raising had become the basis of agriculture in the Midwest by mid-century, and immigrants intended simply to pick up where they had left off. Most, of course, had come not to farm, but to seek riches in gold. Those unfortunate to arrive after 1850, however, found that surface deposits had been depleted by the 100,000 49ers who had gotten there ahead of them. They had brought with them a belief that had long been a staple of rural America, that hard work and right values would be rewarded by success. That faith left them with a sense of personal failure in the gold fields. Too ashamed to return home, they turned to what they knew best, and, whenever possible, to familiar faces. There were, for example, at least eight immigrants from Kenosha, Wisconsin, in Poudre Creek, including George Washington Pierce and his wife, Eunice. Both had been swept westward by the intense excitement of the gold rush in 1852, but came up empty-handed. When champion Hutchinson and Charles Green, owners of the Big Ranch, three miles upstream from Davis and Kenoshans themselves, offered the Pierce's work as hands, they jumped at the chance to start afresh. There were similar pockets of transplants from the Ohio Valley and Missouri frontier as well. Not chain migration, per se, but enough personal connections to help ease the pain of isolation. For most, moreover, this was not the first time they had started over. Midwesterners were already migrants themselves. Yankees, like the Pierces, from the Northeast and New York. Upland, Sutherland, Upland Southerners from Kentucky and Tennessee. And immigrants from Germany and Great Britain. Poudre Creek offered these disillusioned miners not only a comforting familiarity, but a chance to redeem themselves. 
both the Davis stock farm and the big ranch of Hutchinson and Green seem more than worthy of the challenge. The fact that Hutchinson and Green had 800 acres of barley planted within a month after purchasing the big ranch in the fall of 1851, and that Davis already had several thousand head of cattle and 600 acres of grain under fence, underscores how familiar and inviting the environment appeared. Newspapers and visiting committees from the California State Agricultural Society, the society as it was known, regularly reported on their progress and in excruciating detail, down to the last bushel produced, acre plowed, and farm implement purchased, and for much, for much of the decade, the numbers were staggering. Again, just to sort of orient you about the Davis Ranch and the Big Ranch. The Davis Ranch, this is not exactly true, but if you pretty much took the UC Davis campus, right, and picked it up and moved it a little bit eastward so that the center of campus was right, right about first and A in Davis, you pretty much got the Davis Ranch right there. The Big Ranch, uh, further uh, upstream, starting, this sort of depends when you want to describe the Big Ranch, but more or less starting right about Highway 113, right, and heading, uh, heading westward, um, I would say, to about two miles, maybe a little bit more, past Road 98, right, and then from the uh, uh, Poudre Creek up to uh, up to Russell Boulevard. That's about 3,500 acres. Now again, it, that, as you'll see, it depends on when you ask the question, uh, what was the big ranch? Now the fame that these ranches uh, 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 got was, was no accident. Davis and Hutchinson were both instrumental in organizing uh, the California State Agricultural Society in 1854. Its objectives of following the model already common in the Midwest were to disseminate knowledge uh, through fairs and publications and to bring, as Hutchinson put it, stability, security, and independence to the population. Both Davis and Hutchinson were elected as presidents of the society, both won many first place premiums, and both reveled in the attention. For Hutchinson in particular, the opportunity to preach agrarian values seems to reek of hypocrisy. Here was a man well-trained in the fine art of frontier speculation. In Wisconsin, Hutchinson was not only a large grain farmer, he owned the largest, the largest a wheat warehouse, the longest pier into Lake Michigan, and the biggest steam flowering mill in Kenosha. A mid-century drought, however, brought financial ruin and forced him to flee to California to escape the long arm of the law. <laughs> Undaunted, Hutchinson arrived in Sacramento in August of 1850 and opened a mercantile store on J Street that became an overnight success. He became a member of the city council in 1851, was elected mayor in 1852, and in the process earned the sobriquet general. <laughs> but in his heart as well as his pocketbook, Hutchinson longed to return to farming. But Hutchinson was no hypocrite in the eyes of his contemporaries. Their farming experience in the Midwest had taught them to embrace both traditional values and the modern economic order. What we might see as a contradiction was in fact what made General Hutchinson a celebrity. The excitement also reflected Poudre Creek farmers' vigorous response to market opportunities and their extraordinary faith in new agricultural technology, which they also brought with them from the Midwest. Technological innovation, the Reaper uh, in particular, had broken down production barriers in the 1840s. 
Farmers no longer had to limit their fields to the amount their families could harvest, a development that proved downright seductive. The breaking of the production bottleneck dramatically altered farmers' perception of the marketplace from a corrupting influence in the, Je in the Jeffersonian tradition to a golden opportunity all its own. Supply, they now believed, created its own demand. Farmers, or so they thought, could not overproduce, and the more they produced, the better off they would be. It was that fundamental assumption of the 19th century that compelled these plutocrete farmers to operate on such a large scale. The problem, in Davis's case, this is what you get if you win first prize at the state fair. You get a bird's eye view drawing uh, of your ranch. The problem in Davis's case was that expanding operations coincided with a declining market and two of the worst ecological disasters in California history. Davis epitomized what one geographer has called the Midwesternization of California ranching. He gradually replaced Spanish cattle, whose value lay in their hides and tallow, with American breeds, importing them from Ohio and Missouri via the Oregon and California trails. He cut hay to feed livestock during the summer, dry season, rather than relying on native grasses. He grew other grains, fruits, and garden crops to augment his income. He used state-of-the-art tools machinery and methods, and he employed a largely cowboy Anglo workforce. So successful was Davis that the society in 1858 awarded him the highest premium for best improved and furnished stock farm of the first class, the pinnacle of achievement in his profession. But demand from the gold fields had already begun to diminish. Davis's principal buyer, the Empire Market, Sacramento's oldest and largest butcher, paid him $40 a head in 1856, but only $15 four years later. And beef prices on the Sacramento market fell from eight cents to three cents a pound over the same period. The flood of the century in the winter of 1861-1862 at first seemed a blessing by diminishing supply by the thousands in the Sacramento Valley. But it was immediately followed by one of the most severe and prolonged droughts ever to hit the state. For three years, the winter rains stopped. Hundreds of thousands of cattle perished, including most of Davis's. Only the California Pacific Railroad which purchased Davis's land in 1868 to build a major railroad junction saved him from total financial disaster. Hutchinson and Green ran into trouble even sooner. Yields were heavy, their first harvest, the barley harvest of 1852, an astounding 66 bushels per acre. And the crop itself, buyers in Sacramento assured them promised to bring in $15,000. That sum would not even cover costs, however. Fencing, machinery, seed, and above all, labor, it turned out, cost Hutchinson and Green over $33,000. Hands earned at least $75 a month, and harvesters upwards of $10 a day. The gold rush greatly inflated those figures, but the end result was very real to Hutchinson and Green. And when in November 1852, a huge fire in Sacramento burned the entire crop just days after they had hauled and stored it, the big ranch owners found themselves over $40,000 in debt. But no one seemed to panic even at an interest rates of 5% per month. One good crop, creditors and debtors alike believed, one good crop surely take care of everything. So Hutchinson, 
who had no shortage of connections in Sacramento borrowed more, using the big ranch as collateral. Fully equipped with threshing machines, reapers, and a whole host of other implements, Hutchinson and Green planted, and Green planted huge barley and wheat crops over the next two years. The big branch piled up bigger debts. Hutchinson and Green kept borrowing. They had 38 different creditors by the end of the year, but could not even keep up the interest on their loans. By the end of the 1854 season, they could not even pay their workers, including George and Eunice Pierce. The big ranch's total debt now stood at $85,000. One good crop, everyone still believed, would take care of everything. The ranch's uh, biggest creditor, Angus Pearson, certainly thought so. Pearson, a Sacramento land speculator, provided $53,000 to expand operations in advance of the 1855 season. With Hutchinson and Green agreeing to let him to hold most of their improved acreage and all of their farm implements and stock as security for the payment of indebtedness. The big ranch finally had a big crop, grossing over $20,000, but it was not nearly enough to pay off the creditors. Moreover, Frierson had died unexpectedly in February, and over the course of the year, it was revealed that he too had been deeply in debt. <laughs> not the best news for creditors and workers expecting a big payoff on a bumper crop. Additional costs during the season and the accumulated interest left Hutchinson and Green over $100,000 in debt. Still, the belief that one more good crop could take care of everything prevailed. Hutchinson and Green proceeded to devise an elaborate scheme to keep the big ranch afloat. On January 24th, 1856, 12 of Sacramento's most prominent lawyers and bankers agreed to advance a total of $30,000, half of which went to Frierson's estate and half of which was used for carrying on farming operations. The argument further declared that one of the lawyers, Robert C. Clark, would hold all the property, loans, and future proceeds in a trust from which all debts would be paid. All parties involved, still clearly seduced by the big ranch, agreed that it was a good and safe loan. But as Clark recounted, the 1856 crop and the next three crops all fell short of expectation. Drought the first two years and a glutted market the second two prompted Clark to borrow another $50,000 to keep, to try and keep or to enlarge operations even more. By 1859, the big ranch was cultivating over 3,000 acres of grain, but its list of creditors was getting only longer. Two years later, Hutchinson and Green both filed for bankruptcy. The eagerness to keep pumping money into these establishments was all the more astounding given that title to the land itself was in question. No one truly owned the land. Both the Big Ranch and the Davis Ranch were part of Rancho Laguna de Santos Calle, a grant of 11 Spanish leagues. That's roughly 48,000 acres, 75 square miles, north of Puna Creek, and west of the Tule lands. Hutchinson paid only $6,000 to the original grantees, Marcos Vaca and Victor Proudhon, for half of the entire grant in 1851. Davis, uh, through a uh, succession of transactions, paid over just over $10,000 for his 8,000 acres, and several other Midwesterners uh, paid relative Nathaniel Sharp, Joshua Bailey, Edmund Brown, Henry Connor, and Simon Wettner paid relatively little for their tracks as well. 
but just who had suckered whom had yet to be determined. Under the provisions of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and the California Land Act of 1851, the current landowners were required to confirm their titles to a three-member United States Land Commission. Brown, Bailey, and Hutchinson submitted a test case in 1852, and after hearings that dragged on for four years, the commission declared Rancho Laguna de Santos Calle fraudulent. <laughs> Vaca and Proudhon, it turns out, especially Proudhon, had essentially manufactured it out of bed air. <laughs> now, this, this, this is a very interesting map that was produced uh, for these, these trials with the Land Commission by Hutchinson, Green, and, and their lawyers. It's both, both at, at once supposed to look like a decenio, which is the maps distributed by the Mex Mexican government for, for grants such as these. Um, although a typical decenio had none of this type of, of precise boundaries that we're looking at to. And those precise boundaries right, were, were to try to appeal to another group, the Anglo side uh, of this equation. Uh, you can't probably see it, but the names of Hutchinson's Rancho, Brown's Rancho, Bailey's Rancho, they didn't call themselves Rancho, right? They didn't refer to themselves as Don's. Uh, they didn't intermarry uh, with, with uh, uh, Mexicans in the area. Uh, this was their effort, and a rather lame one uh, at that, to, to uh, try and get their grant. Uh, okay. Now, the claimants uh, and their assignees were not the only ones who had a stake in the grant's outcome. Large numbers of farmers and ranchers operating on a much smaller scale were also settling on or near Rancho Laguna de Santos Calle. Indeed, squatters and swamp landers, as those who purchased Thule land were called, played an equally significant and in many ways more lasting role in the making of Poudre Creek. Small farms and large estates developed side by side, up and down the Sacramento Valley, but with the former being much more numerous and widespread than the literature suggests. These farmers and ranchers, large and small alike, were mired in a clash of fundamentally irreconcilable legal principles. On the one hand, when California was transferred to the United States by the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, landowners were guaranteed that their property rights would be inviolably respected. The fact that 75% of the over 800 Mexican land grants in California would eventually be confirmed testifies to the sanctity of treaty obligations and private property in American law. On the other hand, preemption, the preferential right of a settler to purchase public land at a modest price seemed just as compelling. Most of these grants were huge, 1 to 11 leagues, again, a league about 4,400 acres. They were huge, empty, and unproductive. For many who had come of age on the Midwestern frontier during the Jacksonian era, this was monopoly at its worst. For them, land was the foundation of opportunity, freedom, and independence in principle as well as in law, as exemplified by the abundance of national and state preemption acts passed in the 1830s and 1840s. It was inconceivable that treaty or no treaty, thousands of acres of unsurveyed, unoccupied, and unimproved land could be granted to so few individuals. 
Only the United States government seemed not to be caught up in the heat of the moment. Consumed by the turbulence of the decade leading up to the Civil War, Congress treated California like an unwanted child. The lack of attention, urgency, and funding given to the adjudication of these grants forced claimants and squatters to take matters into their own hands. Conflict on Rancho Laguna de Santos Calle was minimal at first. Few squatters found the land desirable. They judged the fertility of the soil, just as they had in the Midwest, by the presence or absence of native vegetation, timber in particular. On Rancho Laguna de Santos Calle, that meant that only the land within a mile or two of Puda Creek or Willow Slough could be cultivated. But that was precisely the land that Davis, Hutchinson, Green, and the other claimants had already enclosed. The rest of the grant, the vast majority of its 48,000 acres, was open prairie, deemed fit only for livestock farming, and held by the claimants as tenants in common. Squatters were also well aware that should the grant be confirmed, they would be ejected and lose whatever improvements they had made. And again, most grants were in fact being confirmed, giving Rancho Laguna de Santos Calle claimants every reason to be confident of their case. Not surprisingly, squatters stayed away. The county assessor found only 20 in the immediate area in 1853, most of them along Puna Creek, either to the west or the east of the grant's presumed boundaries, or way far out uh, up on the prairie. Among them were William Montgomery and Fred Werner, who settled three miles east of the Davis Ranch in 1852. They were what many contemporaries called bona fide squatters, those who entered the land in good faith and with at least the tacit approval of the grants claimants. But after the land commission struck down Rancho Laguna de Santos Calle on January 15, 1856, more squatters moved in. The claimants could still appeal their case to the U.S. District Court and, if necessary, to the Supreme Court. But the mass of conflicting testimony, forged signatures, and shameless perjury from high officials of the Mexican government, all with the blatant intent of swindling land-hungry Anglos, strongly suggested that the land would sooner or later be, cut, be declared part of the public domain and thus subject to preemption. By the summer of 1856, at least 60 new settlers inhabited the region. And by September 18, 1860, when the district court rejected the claimant's appeal, more than 130 squatters had started farms. To many contemporaries and subsequent historians, these were intruders or lawbreakers, especially the sizable group who reportedly employed counsel to help the federal government make their case. They were the ones who gave squatters such a bad name in California, in contrast to the Midwest, where the term was not nearly as derogatory. There were a few ejection suits filed while the case was on appeal. Most notably, George Peck, who had purchased several hundred acres of land along Poudre Creek from Hudson and Green in 1853, fought squatter Lewis Horton three times in court before the end of the decade, and at least once with his fists. <laughs> this was just the sort of battle that has captivated historians of California land over the years. But in focusing so strong on violence, particularly the squatter rights in Sacramento in 1850, historians have all but ignored motives for cooperation. 
conflict did not invariably dominate the relationship between squatters and owners. Indeed, in Poudre Creek, claimants sought more to accommodate squatters than to fight them. In part, this was a deliberate strategy devised by the claimant's lawyers. Because no one could deny anymore that Rancho Laguna de Santa's Calle was a hoax, the appeal had to be made on different grounds. The claimants, their lawyers argued, ought not to be made to suffer just because they had been hoodwinked. What had they done wrong, the lawyers asked, other than purchase the land in good faith, make large improvements, and in general, make a settlement of an area that had previously been unsettled. With that in mind, Hutchinson, uh, <coughs> Davis, and 10 other landholders had the entire grant surveyed, part partitioned among themselves with precise boundaries, sold off portions of the land not already enclosed, rented other parts, and even permitted squatting if agreements were made to vacate or purchase the land should the grant be conformed, confirmed. Claimants also found the squatters invaluable as laborers. Their obsession with new technology notwithstanding, Hutchinson and Green still needed 15 to 18 hands year round, and about 70 during the harvest season by the end of the decade. In 1858 and 1859, two thirds of all of their harvesters were local squatters seeking to supplement their farm income. The going wage had dropped dramatically since the early 1850s to $2 a day, but was still an attractive option to small farmers just starting out. Davis, Connor, Lettner, and the other landholders also took advantage of this convenient source of experienced workers. Accommodation was a small price to pay, they believed. Conventional wisdom, after all, still held that the squatter's land was no good anyway. As late as 1858, federal surveyors identified it as adobe, second rate, and unfit for cultivation. A number of squatters self set out to prove them wrong. While half stayed with stock raising, the others turned to wheat and barley, the crops that had served them so well in the Midwest. The land proved more fertile than it appeared. The water level was only nine to 12 feet below the surface, and the soil, though considerably harder than the bottomlands, could still be cultivated if plowed after the first rains in November. Yields were not spectacular, but 20 bushels per acre was common. In fact, squatters found that just about anything they grew back home could also grow up out on Puda Prairie, as they called it, including apple and peach trees, grapes, corn, oats, onions, and potatoes. No one was more stunned by these developments than the county assessor upon making his rounds in the summer of 1858. He found at least 60 improved farms on Rancho Laguna de Santos Calle where none had existed a year or two before, each containing 25 to 125 acres of wheat and or barley, newly planted orchards and vineyards, and more than a few hogs, turkeys, chickens, and a horse or two. The amount of miscellaneous property that the assessor recorded for each farmer, roughly $50 to $500, suggests that they either shared in or purchased themselves reapers, mowers, plowers, plows, and threshers. So unprepared was the assessor for all this that he had to record his findings on the blank pages in the back of his roll even more unfit for cultivation were the Thule swamps between Rancho Laguna de Santos Calle and the Sacramento River. These impenetrable thickets 
did not deter settlers either, especially those with experience draining swampy prairies in the Midwest. The terms set by the California State Legislature in 1855, moreover, were irresistible. A settler could purchase a maximum of 320 acres for $1 per acre, with a down payment of just 10% and the balance with no interest due in five years. If half the land was reclaimed by that time, the state would grant title. 35 settlers took up the challenge in 1855, 41 in 1856, and another 42 by the end of the decade. Stock raisers learned that burning off the tule in the spring created lush pasture land by the fall. And grain farmers who undertook the arduous task of clearing the land discovered rich, porous soil. There were serious problems, however. Swamplanders knew that they too could be ejected if the courts confirmed Rancho Laguna de Santa's Calle and included the Tule swamps in its borders. Just where to draw the line between swampland and dry land was not clear either. The Federal Swampland Act of 1850, which ceded these lands to the state, required federal surveyors to decide. But after waiting five years, the state legislature authorized its own survey. Buyers lived in fear that the swampland they had purchased from the state might well be declared public land later by the federal government. More tangible was the expense of reclamation itself, about $1,000 to reclaim 320 acres. They planted crops and made improvements like their neighbors out on the prairie, but by the end of 1860, the majority of these swamplanders were closed. Swamplanders and squatters were seduced by the market every bit as much as large landholders. Given a taste of what the Sacramento Valley could produce, they were bound and determined to overcome all obstacles. The gold rush did not create their profit-minded mentality. They brought it with them from the Midwest. Nor did the gold rush dampen their community sentiments. As a result, they did, in fact, make a settlement, Puda Creek, as they called it, as early as 1852. It's highly active economy and spirited citizenry made it in the eyes of a reporter of the Daily Alta, California in 1860, the richest cereal district in California, even though not one farmer in the region, large or small, held clear title to the land. <laughs> At the center of this community, the Puda Creek was the ranch of Jerome C. Davis. Most large landholders agree that accommodation with settlers was best for both sides. But only Davis saw that there was money to be made from it. All of these new farms, he realized, required capital, machinery, and markets. Borrowing $10,000 from a Sacramento heiress in 1856 he built a slaughterhouse, a steam flour mill, a dairy, and two large manufacturing shops. By 1860, virtually every settler within a five to 10 mile radius of the Davis Ranch opened an account with balances ranging from $5 to $5,000. They sold their stock and produce, obtained advances, and purchased reapers, wagons, and harnesses, and various sundries. Prices and interest rates were slightly higher than in Sacramento, but convenient access to market more than made up for it, especially during the winter months when crossing the Thule was often impossible. Davis then sold the flour, fresh meat, 
and daily uh, dairy products, not only to Sacramento merchants and hotels, but to landholders, large landholders in the area with large workforces. For a while, the profits he made as middleman offset his losses in the cattle market. By 1860, he was the wealthiest man in the region with an estate worth $110,000. The Davis Ranch was not only a marketplace, it was also, as Davis himself later put it, a very public place, the center of the community. It was not unusual for 20 or 30 squatters and swamplanders to conduct transactions on the same day. This gave them the opportunity to discuss new farming techniques, boast of recent improvements, and bask in their accomplishments in the midst of the large, modern facilities of the Davis Ranch. Other activities on the ranch reflected the growing presence of women in the area. In the early 1850s, males outnumbered females by more than 10 to 1. But as miners turned farmers, felt more settled on their homestead, and more importantly, felt the pinch of labor, they began calling for their farm families to join them. By 1860, single male farms were the exception rather than the rule. As a result, evening dances and Sunday morning churches were held regularly in Davis's palatial home. The biggest event of the year was the 4th of July. In 1856, ceremonies commenced with Davis himself reading the Declaration of Independence, followed by toasts to the governor of California and the president of the United States, political discussions, sack races, apple bobbing, a greased polo context, an elegant supper, and dancing that continued well into the night. Given the lack of extensive kin and family networks uh, in the region, these neighborhood activities had special meaning to settlers to preserve in the Sacramento Valley, Valley what they valued back home. Among males, that commitment manifested itself in local government as well. Nothing made settlers feel more at home than the activities, procedures, and institutions of county and township government. Most of these were established by the first legislature, state legislature in 1850, which often employed the identical language of lawmakers from the Midwest. Residents expected that they would be called upon to serve. At the very least, this meant paying their taxes, which they did at a rate of over 90% in the 1850s. Delinquent payers faced harsh attachment laws and the possibility that the land commission or district court would find them unworthy of a patent. But their compliance stemmed primarily from a sense of obligation. Government, they knew, rested squarely on their shoulders. Large landholders, squatters, and swamplanders alike served on juries, supervised elections, appraised stray animals, and perhaps most importantly, early on, built roads and bridges. The law required every able-bodied adult male to donate five days' labor a year on the roads, and virtually no one refused. Citizens decided where these roads would be built by petitioning the Board of Supervisors and determined their quality by the time and energy devoted to their construction and maintenance. By 1860, a matrix of good roads connected farmers in southern Yellow County to the Davis Ranch in Sacramento. Important decisions were made in Sacramento and Washington, D.C., but residents focused on local issues and placed a premium on local participation, even though none of them had lived there for more than a few years. The centrality of localism 
was also reflected in the abundance of individuals who sought county office. Between 1850 and 1860, 67 men from Puda Township ran for judge, sheriff, assessor, coroner, auditor, public administrator, surveyor, treasurer, or recorder. The highest authority by far was the justice of the peace. State law limited their jurisdiction to claims of $200 or less. But settlers invariably turned first to their local judge to settle just about any dispute. From 1857 to 1862, they entrusted the office to George W. Pierce. Pierce had become a local hero when he sued the administrator of Angus Frearson's estate in the summer of 1856. The big ranch's largest creditor never had paid Pierce or his wife their wages, which totaled $1,700. On the advice of the local justice, Swamplander William Martin, Pierce filed his complaint in the district court of Sacramento County and upon losing their appeal to the California Supreme Court. At stake was not only a large sum of money, but the fate of dozens of workers who shared the Pierce's predicament. The main opposition came from the big ranch's long line of creditors who argued that their loans took precedence over back wages. The court ruled otherwise and awarded Pierce a full settlement $2,345, including interests and costs. But despite everything he had witnessed, Pierce was still mesmerized by the big ranch. He used the money to purchase 383 acres of prime land along Poudre Creek. As justice of the peace, Pierce showed no mercy to negligent employers, consistently enforcing his own precedent. For that, he would be Judge Pierce in Poudre Creek until his death in 1891. Candidates for local office came almost exclusively from the ranks of Pierce and Mark, not Hutchinson and Davis. Sheer numbers accounted for this at first. Squatters, swamplanders, and workers were inherently representative of the broader electorate. Over time, longevity became an equally important variable. Through the 1860s, roughly eight out of every 10 men elected to local office in Poudre Township were long-term residents, relatively speaking. That group included just one of the Rancho Laguna de Santos Calle grantees. Only Charles Green, at the encouragement of Pierce, his close friend, chose to try his luck on prairie land that he himself would have deemed unfit for cultivation just a short time earlier. The others fled, the other grantees fled, even after Davis almost single-handedly lobbied through Congress in 1864 a federal statute that allowed them to repurchase their land at $1.25 an acre. Massive debts, the flood of 1861-62, and the subsequent drought were just too much to overcome. Many squatters moved on as well, but about 35% of them, which is a high rate in American rural history, 35% persevered. With Rancho Laguna de Santos Calle finally settled, their land was finally open to preemption. Even with crops failing and livestock dying, they filed their declaratory statements with the state land office and eventually received their patents. Swamplanders, whose farms lay under eight feet of water during the flood, were less likely to stay, but those who did were rewarded by the federal government, which in 1866 finally recognized the surveys made by the state a decade earlier. Who better to address, to entrust the burden of government, the voters asked, than to these pioneer settlers? They were revered 
not only for their persistence, but for their innovation and eventual economic success as well. Squatters and swamplanders received very little attention from the California State Agricultural Society or local newspapers. But they were the ones, they were the ones who provided tangible evidence that the adobe and the tule could be cultivated. With the region now thoroughly surveyed, preemptors and speculators alike swarmed over the remaining public land. Where one year ago not a house could be seen, reported the Yolo County Democrat in 1867, nearly every acre of land is now taken up and under proper cultivation. The attraction was the beginning of an extraordinary agrarian episode, California's bonanza wheat era. By coincidence, California produced three straight bumper crops after the drought broke in 1865, at exactly the same time that Great Britain and other European nations suffered dangerously deficient harvests. Enterprising grain merchants in San Francisco and Liverpool, including the legendary Isaac Friedlander, exploited the opportunity to the fullest, as did farmers in Poudre Creek. As production skyrocketed from 1866 to 1869, farm incomes more than tripled, and land values rose to as much as $20 per acre. Pierce used his newfound wealth to build his own big ranch, a new house, new furniture, new gang plows, a new orchard and vineyard, and another 900 acres of land, all where Hutchinson and Green had failed a decade earlier. This dramatic turn of events confirmed, confirmed all the more the prevailing belief among these farmers that demand would inevitably outpace production. Developments over the next three decades would eventually expose that as folly, but for the time being, farmers had finally struck gold. Had Pierce and his neighbors helped launch California agriculture in the wrong direction? Much of the literature would have it that they were greedy capitalists who, upon failing as greedy miners, took up the most easily and profitably produced frontier crop. But Poudre Creek farmers' motivations were considerably more complex. From the outset, large landholders, squatters, and swamplanders alike aggressively pursued market, market opportunities even though the odds were stacked against them. No rational person, one economist has reasoned, should have taken up farming given the high cost of production, land controversies, and volatile climate. Their willingness to take risks, even poorly calculated ones, stemmed not from greed per se, but from deeply ingrained cultural values that had been jolted by the gold rush. The first generation of California farmers had not intended to farm at all, but having failed in the mines, they became desperate to succeed on the land. In their haste to replicate their Midwestern past, they committed themselves not only to the market, but to community life as well, and with a resolve and a sense of permanence that can only be described as remarkable. The fact that a community of any sort emerged along Poudre Creek defies conventional wisdom about rural California, which has emphasized wheat kings, land barons, and farm factories. This was a community, moreover, of considerable stability. Of the 146 farmers in Poudre Creek in 1860, 49 of them, or their sons, would take part in the next great agrarian 
episode in California, the transition from wheat to specialty crops at the turn of the century. 11 of the 15 charter members of the Davisville Almond Growers Association, founded in 1897, were pioneer settlers or sons of pioneer settlers from the 1850s and 1860s. That persistence constitutes the central theme of this history, as exemplified once again by Rattler the Trotting Stallion. Rattler left a lasting influence all his own. Many of his offspring, always identified as sired by their famous father, went on to celebrated careers, and horse racing itself became an obsession in Yoyo County. Racetracks were built on the outskirts of seemingly every town. The people of Yolo, insisted the Sacramento Daily Union, have been the sport's best and most constant patrons. Raising horses and gambling at the track had cultural meaning to its participants beyond just the chance to make money. These activities allowed them to entertain the same impulse that had failed them during the gold rush. That impulse persisted into the 20th century. Local ranchers won so many Royal Purple Grand Champion ribbons at state, local, state, and national competitions in the 1910s and 1920s that the area within a 12-mile radius of the city of Davis, the site of the old Davis Ranch, became known as the Purple Circle. <laughs> among, among its members was John Elmo Montgomery, grandson of the pioneer settler. John Elmo not only trained several prize-winning trotters and pacers, he drove Jim Logan to victory at the Woodland Track in 1914, breaking the record once held by Rattler himself. Thank you very much.